So first of all, um, let's talk about what we're planning to cover. And um, uh, the organizers had a very long list of objectives, which is awesome. Uh, I tried to make it more uh, clinically oriented for you guys to be able to identify um, clinical scenarios where you would be sitting in your clinic or sort of in a in an oral exam and thinking of what's my next step and where to go next. So hopefully this will give you some kind of a clinical sense and tie up uh, the guidelines and the thyroid diseases in one little picture. So we're going to go over a bit of thyroid surgical anatomy, some physiology. Then we're going to take this uh, major, this big approach to uh, thyroid nodules. Um, and through the approach, we're going to talk about the imaging guidelines, the fine needle aspiration cytology guidelines, and then how to manage your patients based on these findings. Um, then we'll go on to talk about the surgical management of thyroid cancer and uh, we'll touch on radioactive iodine management. Um, we'll talk a bit about the technical uh, parts of um, thyroid surgery as well. So first of all, thyroid anatomy. So the thyroid is located in uh, sort of the mid to lower neck across the uh, upper tracheal rings. Uh, it has two lobes and an isthmus. And um, it's... Um, it, it's very, it, it has a very beautiful structure and it's located in, in this really tight spot surrounded by very important and vital structures of the aerodigestive tract, the great vessels, and um, a lymphadenopathy in the neck. So when you look at the thyroid, um, there are a couple of things as a surgeon anatomically that uh, we want you to know. First of all, it's blood supply. So it's supplied by two pairs of arteries and three pairs of veins. And um, you guys probably know all these uh, little uh, minutia. Uh, so we have the superior thyroid artery uh, coming off uh, the uh, external carotid artery and coming up to the superior pole. Uh, the inferior thyroid artery is, is a branch of the thyrocervical trunk. Um, the inferior thyroid artery is very important because of its uh, relationship to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which we'll talk about shortly. As well, um, the inferior thyroid artery supplies uh, blood supply to the parathyroid glands, both superior and inferior. The veins correspond to these two arteries in addition to the middle thyroid vein, uh, which is uh, a pain during dissection. Uh, but if you identify it early and uh, um, clip it, uh, it really helps you uh, proceed with your dissection. All right. So if we look at the relationship uh, of our uh, vessels to our important nerves. We have two very important nerves. This picture is going to show us the external branch of the superior laryngeal artery, which comes in to supply the cricothyroid muscle, uh, as well as give some sensory supply to the supraglottis um, uh, and the larynx. So the location of it is actually, uh, people talk about it a lot. We rarely see it um, because when it comes down in the neck, it follows the superior thyroid pedicle. And as it follows it, it divides into the internal and in the external branches. The internal takes its way and in, in, uh, supplies the larynx. The external follows the superior thyroid pedicle in about a centimeter before the thyroid pedicle enters the superior pole of the thyroid, what happens is, is that the external branch of the superior laryngeal just diverges away. So you've heard this a lot, I'm sure from your uh, seniors, stay close to the thyroid when you're dividing your pedicle, stay close to the thyroid. And there's, there's a really important thing uh, about that. The reason is, if you do stay close to the thyroid, then you are less likely to injure the superior laryngeal nerve. 
thankfully, the superior laryngeal nerve uh, function uh, is important in pitch. And when uh, it's injured, most of us regular people will not notice it. But if you have a professional singer or someone who is, uses his voice in a professional way, they will notice uh, they can't reach certain pitches that they used to be. So that's for superior laryngeal nerve. Now, for our recurrent laryngeal nerve, if we look at it, the recurrent laryngeal nerve is, um, is such a beautiful nerve. It has a long course of anatomy. And during its long course, it can be subject to uh, multiple injuries. It's much more important when we talk about um, thyroid and recurrent laryngeal nerve because its injury will cause significant problems to any patient. So they will notice some hoarseness of voice. Uh, if we do have bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve injuries, that's a more significant problem that we'll talk about later. Uh, but it's very important to um, preserve this nerve, of all nerves, but this nerve because it will cause some problems in the future. And if we look at the nerve, it really loops uh, from anterior to posterior around the right subclavian on the right and uh, around the thyroid arch just beside um, uh, ligamentum arteriosum on the left. Now, if you notice um, the location, so um, I hope the picture is clear. So this is your right recurrent laryngeal and this is your left recurrent laryngeal. So one of the things we always mention, it's very subtle, but it actually is important and you can notice it in your uh, surgical dissections, is the fact that the left recurrent lar laryngeal really follows a straight course in the neck and it falls into the tracheoesophageal groove as it, falls, uh, as it follows uh, its course superiorly. The right recurrent laryngeal nerve has a more um, angled uh, direction where it's more slanted following into the neck. So this is really important to sort of note. Um, the entrance is at the cricothyroid junction. Uh, this is where it enters the larynx. And um, in most uh, cases, you can actually see that. Its relationship to the inferior, the recurrent laryngeal nerves relationship to the uh, inferior thyroid artery is crucial. Sorry, the inferior thyroid artery is usually anterior to the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve in about 70% of the cases. So we do have some cases where it could be uh, lying posterior to it. So we need to be careful. Um, so another anomaly that you may see, it's, it's rare, but we have seen it before, is a non-recurrent laryngeal nerve. And this usually occurs when there are some vascular anomalies uh, in the great vessels and with an aberrant sort of retroesophageal uh, subclavian. So instead of the nerve coming down embryologically and turning around, it actually just leaves the vagus and directly goes into the larynx. And this is a very rare anomaly, but you may be able to see it. I've seen one case of this um, in, in, during residency even. And uh, it's, it's interesting because you keep thinking uh, what happened to the nerve, what happened to the nerve, and thankfully it's safe and it's uh, up there. So this is one of the important structures while we're dissecting our uh, thyroid. The other important structure was what Dr. Selman spoke about on Sunday, the parathyroid glands. Um, I won't beat this topic as you've heard about it in detail recently, uh, but again, the location of uh, the inferior parathyroids is more variable. The superior parathyroids are have a more uh, consistent location. Uh, the relationship of the parathyroid really is um, related to the inferior, uh, to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, where the superior parathyroids lie in a plane deep to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, and the inferior parathyroids lie in a plane superficial to uh, the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, I actually like this picture because it kind of depicts that whole plane, and you can see how the superior lies 
posterior to it and the inferior lies anterior to it. All right. So uh, moving on, um, the thyroid hormone um, uh, physiology is quite important, um, more for the endocrinologist, uh, but for us as surgeons, we do uh, care about uh, our T3 and T4, uh, the T3 being more active than the T4, and uh, the sort of negative feedback inhibition uh, of uh, of the TSH from the thyrotropic releasing hormone in the hypothalamus. So these are little things that we really need to make sure that we take care of. Um, one of the things to take uh, to watch is that this thyroid stimulating hormone, uh, which is released from the anterior pituitary, its job is to help efflux the iodide into the follicle. So what it does when we have high TSH levels, it just encourages uh, the thyroid to just absorb the iodide from the circulation and start forming uh, our hormones. Uh, and we'll talk about that at the end with the radioactive iodine treatments. So approach to a thyroid nodule, whether the patient on the right shows up or the patient on the left shows up. It's pretty much a very similar approach. We're always going to approach it with a history. The history really needs to be a focused thyroid-related history. Ask questions about hypo or hyperfunction of the thyroid gland. Uh, ask questions about the duration of the illness. Uh, any rapid growth is important and talk about risk factors. So the risk factors, we're going to allude to them as well when we talk about thyroid carcinoma, but uh, talk, ask about family history of thyroid carcinoma, uh, ask about family history of pheochromocytoma, uh, family history of some syndromes that could be associated with thyroid carcinoma. The physical examination itself, it's a head to toe examination. It's a general examination with focus on the head and neck. Examining the head and neck has to be um, examining the thyroid as well as cervical lymphadenopathy for any palpable lymph nodes. Uh, in addition to examining the vocal cords with indirect laryngoscopy if able to or referring them for that kind of examination. Part of the initial battery of examining a thyroid nodule or investigating a thyroid nodule includes a serum TSH, not necessarily a full thyroid function test, uh, an ultrasound of the neck and thyroid. CT and MRI is reserved for cases where you're either suspicious of uh, retrosternal goiter or if there's cases of uh, suspicious cervical lymphadenopathy that you want to identify further. Now, according to the uh, American Thyroid Association guidelines, the TSH will guide you to see whether the patient has a normal or high uh, TSH or a low TSH. In cases of a low TSH, an iodine scan is um, indicated. In a normal or high TSH, you should proceed immediately to an ultrasound and then following that uh, fine needle aspiration cytology. Um, the, the scan is really to identify whether we have a hot nodule or a cold nodule. Although a hot nodule is rarely malignant less in less than 5% of the cases, uh, it's, it's not zero. And my personal preservation is I actually do not do a thyroid scan. And I'm, I'm mentioning it here because it's part of the guideline. So it's not uh, incorrect if you guys do uh, request that, but um, it's uh, in, in reality, in clinical practice, it's rarely done. We usually proceed with an ultrasound and then a fine needle aspiration cytology. So let's move on to ultrasonography. So ultrasonography of the thyroid is, uh, has really moved a very long way. And certain features are very important and uh, significant and indicate um, suspicious. So the few that we'll talk about, the, these are all of the um, suspicious features. The ones with an asterisk are the most uh, sensitive, 
but not in isolation. They need to be all three together, which is the microcalcification, having an irregular border, and being taller than white on transverse uh, sonography. Uh, the other ones that may indicate issues are the absence of the peripheral halo, having a hypoechoic nodule in comparison to the rest of the thyroid and the, uh, the strap muscles, uh, having um, intranodular blood flow rather than uh, peripheral blood flow, and then any evidence of extrathyroidal extension on ultrasound. So what's more important is our TIRAD uh, classification, which uh, the majority of, uh, I would say the majority of hospitals in Kuwait are um, reporting thyroid uh, nodules with the thyroid classification. So thyroid uh, stands for uh, thyroid imaging, reporting and data system. And they are looking at five certain features in each nodule. So they will examine the thyroid incomplete measure all the, thought, uh, the nodules they see, and then they will characterize these nodules uh, according to this system, looking at several features, including the composition, the echogenicity, the shape, uh, the margin, and presence of echogenic foci, which are the calcification. And for each feature, there are a number of points. And then when you calculate them, you do get uh, the, the, um, the classification of the nodule as a tyrad 1 through 5. And each classification has its own implications. So uh, a lower number is less suspicious for malignancy. And more and more, there's more evidence and uh, more studies coming out that are showing us that we could be comfortable enough to not do an FNA for these patients. As the number goes higher, there is a very high suspicion for malignancy, and they do recommend FNA at smaller sizes. So as the suspicion grows, they recommend FNA as, uh, for as small as one centimeter. And there are differences between the American College of Radiology and the American Thyroid Association about the recommendations based on the thyroid classification. Now, what's very important uh, for us as clinicians looking at this is we really don't look at the patient with just the TIRAD system. We need to look at the patient as a global picture. The patient's risk factors, the patient's uh, clinical history, the TIRAD system, as well as the fine needle aspiration cytology. So I just want to remind you that there it's very important to sort of look at it from a global picture, always in the thyroid, and not look at one feature and make it guide you one way or another. And I'll repeat that again several times today. Um, so again, from the American Thyroid Association, uh, they sort of show us pretty much similar to what the TIRAD system is, but they, they have different nomenclature. And really, they, estimate, they have the estimated risk of malignancy for each. And based on that, they're having their FNA um, recommendations. So the other thing that we have to look at when we're assessing the uh, ultrasound for thyroid glands, we have to look at the lymph nodes because this is an important part and it goes hand in hand with thyroid carcinoma. And it's the abnormal findings of cervical lymph node metastases uh, is having more of a round globular shape. Uh, and one of the telltelling signs is loss of, of the echogenic hilum. This is really um, an alarming sign in any patient. If you see a loss of the echogenic hilum, it's where your vessels go in. That means there's something going on that's abnormal in that um, lymph node. As well, uh, peripheral flow uh, rather than hilar flow, blood vessel flow is uh, concerning. If there is punctant uh, echogenic foci, uh, these represent microcalcifications, and these as, as well are concerning. So these are just some of the features that um, if you see on your ultrasound report, uh, they should be, uh, they should 
ring an alarm and uh, sort of make you think of what to do next. Now, why I mentioned all these features and not just said the Tyrad system, because despite it being um, uh, widely adopted, uh, the problem is sometimes you will not have a radiologist who's comfortable enough to report with Tyrad system. So what you have to do is you should be able to look at the ultrasound report and be able to comfortably decide if this is a high risk or a low risk based on what you see. Obviously, if you can get that done in your center, that's uh, even much better. So next, after doing an ultrasound, we're gonna look at the ultrasound. We're gonna decide if we wanna do a fine needle aspiration cytology for this patient. And this is really based on whether this patient has a high risk or a low risk for malignancy. So according, so I'm gonna start with the high risk for malignancy. So with Tyrad 5, the American College of Radiology uh, is suggesting that we really need to do the fine needle aspiration cytology only if uh, it's larger than one centimeter, larger or equal to. But, uh, and to follow the patient uh, up with surveillance if uh, the nodule is more than or equal to 0.5 centimeters. Um, however, the American Thyroid Association uh, agrees with them on this. With the Tyrad 4, uh, the American College of Radiology suggests spinal aspiration cytology if the, if the nodule is larger than 1.5 centimeters. However, the American Thyroid Association does want to do a fine needle aspiration cytology if it's larger than one centimeter. For a Tyrad 3, again, American College of Radiology says 2.5 centimeters as their cutoff, and the American Thyroid Association says 1.5. And for Tyrad 2 and 1, which are considered low suspicion, um, it's, it's really uh, different. So if you have a very low suspicion based on ultrasonographic features and clinical features, then the recommendation is to either do a follow-up or do a, a follow-up ultrasound to see if it enlarges or not. And uh, if... Uh, if the nodule is uh, larger than two centimeters, you can consider fine needle aspiration cytology. So they kind of left the ball in your court and you can decide what you want to do. With purely cystic um, thyroid nodules, really the, um, the, the studies have shown that you really don't need to do a fine needle aspiration cytology as purely cystic uh, uh, thyroid nodules do not carry a high risk of malignancy. If it's a mixed six stick solid, no, it, it's off this category. When I'm talking, I'm saying purely cystic. Okay. All right, there we go. So now with the fine needle aspiration cytology, uh, we, we need a sort of a universal language to understand what the results are. So they developed um, uh, the Bethesda system for reporting uh, thyroid cytopathology. And really they looked at a meta-analysis of eight studies and they calculated the risk based uh, on the portion of nodules in each diagnostic category. So. So we have several categories. So the first one is unsatisfactory, okay? And this is really the, the gray zone where we need to figure out what's going on. Then we have benign. So they're, they clearly know it's a benign uh, lesion. And with that, the actual risk of malignancy is from one to 10%, which is pretty reasonable. The third category is the FLUS. It, it carries two names depending on the center that you're in. They usually recommend that uh, a center adopts one of other name, one name or another, either AUS or ATP of undetermined significance, or F FLUS or follicular lesion of undetermined significance. And with this, if you if you see the range of risk of malignancy, it's between six to forty eight percent. And we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a few minutes. 
The uh, next category is a follicular neoblasm, or it's suspicious for follicular uh, carcinoma. And again, the risk of malignancy is up to 34%. Uh, the last two categories, we treat them as if it's a confirmed malignancy, because as you see, it goes up to 97% uh, malignancy in a, in a cytology that's suspicious for malignancy, and up to 99%. Uh, for uh, up to 100% for those that are cytology positive. One little point about uh, ultrasound, uh, about fine needle aspiration cytology, um, more and more there's a direction and move to uh, recommend ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration cytology. It's, uh, it's the best, it's the better way to do it, even if it's a palpable uh, lymph node. Um, and if the first uh, biopsy was not done with ultrasound guided biopsy, uh, as, uh, ultrasound guided uh, aspiration, uh, and you got an ATP of undetermined significance, or if it was non diagnostic, they do recommend that the second one be done uh, using uh, ultrasound guidance. So I'm, I'm going to take you through um, the, Bethesda, the system to sort of figure out what we need to do uh, based on the findings. So if we do have uh, the diagnosis of insufficient or non-diagnostic, if you do have a cystic structure or a cystic nodule and you, it has a um, worrisome ultrasonographic features, then you should consider ultrasound guided fine needle cyt uh, cytology. If you have a solid um, nodule, it, the guidelines are very different. They say repeat it. So they don't say consider, they're not gentle with you. So either repeat it and it must be ultrasound guided if possible, or do a diagnostic hemithyroidectomy so you can figure out what's going on. If you do have a um, benign uh, fine needle aspiration cytology, uh, then you sort of want to go back and look at your um, ultrasound, uh, your TIRAD system. So if it's a TIRAD 5, um, usually you want to follow up within the first year of that ultrasound with a repeat ultrasound and a possibly repeat of fine needle aspiration cytology. If it's a TIRAD 3 or 4, you can sort of stretch that up to two years but consider fine needle aspiration cytology if there's significant growth. Significant growth is 20% growth from the previous or development of new lesions or change in the features of the lesions. If you do have a very low suspicion, which is a TIRAD 1 or 2, they recommend doing an ultrasound in 24 months. And if for any of these lesions, you repeat the fine needle aspiration cytology for the second time and it comes back benign, they do they don't recommend that you repeat the ultrasound for a third and a fourth and a fifth, uh, the fine needle aspiration cytology for multiple times. So coming up to um, the FLUS or the follicular lesion of undetermined significance or a follicular neoplasm. Um, you have several different things that you can do. And it's because it's, um, the report, when they report a FLUS uh, diagnosis on the cytology, uh, they found that those patients who go on to have their thyroid surgery and then they looked at the correlation, they found a very high rate of thyroid malignancy in some studies and then a very low rate of malignancy. So they're sort of trying still to figure this out to see uh, what's the best um, what's going on and how they can characterize it better. So um, a couple of things that you can do, and it really depends on your center. Um, you can repeat your ultrasound or the fine needle aspiration cytology, and that could be within two to three months, up to six months. Um, and that's mainly for uh, the FLUS more than the uh, follicular neoplasm. Molecular testing is another thing that's coming up and strong, and it may give an indication uh, on what we can do or how we can help our patients better to be able to do that. If, for example, um, 
the cytology isn't working, it's not giving you a diagnose, diagnosis, and you don't have molecular testing to um, help you, and you're pretty concerned about your patient, then a diagnostic surgery, which is could be a diagnostic hemithyroidectomy, uh, will give you a diagnosis. And that is indicated in the follicular neoplasm, but in a FLUS, you can have several options. Now, just as a reminder, ultrasound and cytology is very operator dependent and there are several factors that affect the results of what you get and wherever you end up practicing you really need to get to know your sonographers to get to know your cytologists and talk to them and make sure they uh, you understand their level and where things are going so they will help you and guide you in the management of your patient So for Bethesda uh, 5 and 6, which are suspicious for uh, papillary thyroid cancer or positive for malignancy, really molecular testing is not indicated if it won't alter your decision making. So, uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit, touch on the molecular testing and the important things that we have about it, but really it's not indicated if it won't change uh, what you want to do in your surgery. If it will change your decision for surgery uh, or the extent of surgery that you're planning to do, then yes, for sure, go ahead and do your molecular testing. For these patients, um, you should discuss with the patient a hemithyroidectomy versus a total thyroidectomy and really look at the global picture. I told you I'm going to be re repeating myself today and look at the clinical risk factors, the sonographic features, what the patient prefers. Because uh, again, you need to involve the patient in the, the decision. And sometimes you cannot offer the patient a hemithyroidectomy. So you will be telling them that that's the option. But when there's the option between the two, if it's a solitary uh, nodule, then you can discuss that with the patient. And then talking to the patient about the molecular test results and what they implicate and how they play into their diagnosis and how that changes the management. Um, the main molecular test that you'll hear us talking about is the BRAF mutation because it does uh, confer close to 100% possibility of malignancy, but uh, there are many factors that play into uh, the molecular testing that we'll discuss shortly. So coming up to the molecular testing, and so these, uh, these four mutations account for about 70% of the known genetic alterations in differentiated thyroid carcinoma. Uh, and these are the alteration, the MAP kinase uh, pathways. And they, the main one is uh, the BRAF, uh, V600E. Uh, others include the RAS point muta mutation, the translocation of the uh, RET-PTC, the translocation of the PACs, and these four uh, genes have been identified, as I said, and they are indifferentiated thyroid carcinomas, okay? And they've assisted really pretty much mostly with uh, the diagnostic accuracy. Um, it's, it's important that to identify that um, for thyroid cytology specimens, um, it's really molecular testing is just an adjunct. Uh, we have the, the kits that are available. There are two main kits. One is a seven gene kit and one is the uh, GEC kit. These two kits work in a different way. So the seven gene kit is really a rule in test. So uh, it's, it's, pre it's pretty good at uh, identifying uh, cancer, but it really can't rule out disease. 
the GETA, GEC test is more of a rule out test. So uh, it helps you identify benign disease. But at the same time, these tests really uh, depend their performance and their um, uh, reporting really depends on your center and how much you see. So if, if you're in a center that has a high load of malignancy or in, a, in an area or a country or a city that has high rates of malignancy, the seven uh, gene MT test will perform better. If you're in an area with more benign disease, you'll find that the GEC will perform better. So molecular testing is important. Take it with a grain of salt and make sure um, that you're able to interpret it properly uh, to uh, according to your center. All right, so I will actually, so this is just the positive predictive value of the rule in test and the negative predictive value of the rule out test. And this chart just shows you how the test performs based on a center, uh, based on the prevalence of cancer in each center with a low prevalence, a higher, and then the highest. Uh, and I'll just jump over those and keep moving. So for malignant thyroid carcinomas, we have, um, these are the main uh, thyroid carcinomas. We have the differentiated thyroid carcinomas, uh, which we consider the papillary, the follicular, and the herthal cell carcinoma. The undifferentiated are, is the anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. And then we have the medullary thyroid carcinoma, which arises from the uh, follicular C cells. Now, medicine, so it's not um, completely out of the question to see a lymphoma uh, and very rare, but have seen this before, metastatic disease to the thyroid from uh, different sites, um, mainly the kidneys. It could, uh, renal cell carcinoma can metastasize to the thyroid very rarely. So the risk factors for thyroid carcinoma in general. So they found that women are three times more likely to have uh, well-differentiated thyroid carcinoma than men, and two times more likely to have anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. Um, now, the follicular and anaplastic thyroid have been found more commonly in areas of endemic goiter. And then one of the risk factors that we talked about is exposure to ionizing radiation. And this has been studied uh, significantly uh, in areas of um, that were exposed to nuclear weapons as well. It's been seen in patients who had, uh, for example, Hodgkin's lymphoma and received radiation to the neck and chest. And so if a patient has a history of radiation exposure and presents with a palpable thyroid nodule, they have a up to a 50% risk of developing malignancy and it's usually a uh, papillary thyroid cancer. The other thing to keep in mind is a palpable thyroid nodule is usually a nodule that's larger than one uh, centimeter in diameter, depending on the location in and out. Now, family history of thyroid carcinoma. When we talk about papillary thyroid carcinoma, we really don't discuss the family history of thyroid carcinoma, but more recently, they're starting to find that about 6%, and this was reported in the United States, of papillary thyroid cancer carcinoma have uh, a family history. And when we say a family history, it's that uh, they need to show at least four first degree relatives who developed papillary thyroid cancer to call it a uh, family history of thyroid carcinoma. Um, thyroid carcinoma could be associated with other malignancies, including uh, breast, renal, CNS, ovarian malignancies, and it could be associated with other syndromes, uh, Gardner syndrome or familial uh, adenosis uh, polyposis. Uh, Cowden disease also is uh, associated with uh, differentiated thyroid carcinoma. Of course, a family history of medullary thyroid carcinoma or the men syndromes uh, really requires uh, evaluation of uh, the uh, mutation. So moving on, 
Now, papillary thyroid carcinoma is the most common form of thyroid malignancy, and it accounts for up to 70% of all thyroid malignancies worldwide. Now, it's um, it, we're seeing more and more of papillary thyroid carcinoma, and uh, we're getting those incidentalomas, uh, where there's an incidental micro papillary thyroid carcinoma, which is pretty much less than one centimeter in size. Uh, and in these um, patients, um, and, and this is why we think that we're seeing a, a higher number of thyroid carcinomas. With the incidentalomas, um, it, it created this controversy about what to do with them, uh, especially if it's a single one. It's usually a patient who's going to have surgery for their thyroid for another reason, and then the pathology just shows uh, the micropapillary thyroid carcinoma. As you probably know, the papillary thyroid carcinomas tend to be multifocal, and it's really their affinity to lymphatics. So they, that's why it's multifocal. It could be bilateral, and it could be, involve the uh, uh, cervical lymph nodes early on. Now, and with papillary thyroid carcinoma, they have found uh, that there is involvement of the level six cervical lymph nodes in a very microscopic fashion uh, in up to 80% of patients. And this is where a lot of people talk about the central uh, neck dissection, which we will discuss further. Um, So papillary thyroid carcinoma is one of those that has this very characteristic histologic features of the papillary fronds with their fibrovascular uh, stock and the samoma bodies. And cytologically, you see the orphan anti-nuclei, you see the nuclear grooves, you see the intranuclear uh, inclusions. And uh, usually the, the cells themselves are shorter, more cuboidal cells. Um, this is a common uh, question, at least in uh, our specialty, uh, to ask about uh, histologic features and cytologic features of papillary thyroid carcinoma. Now, the histologic subtypes, there are several histologic subtypes, but what's important is the uh, ones with the asterisks because they carry a worse prognosis. As you know, Papillary thyroid carcinoma has a very good 10-year uh, and 20-year survival, above 97%. But when it comes to these um, histologic subtypes, uh, they do carry a worse prognosis for the patient. Uh, however, m the majority of them don't really affect the survival, but they do affect the disease control. And as we're gonna talk about the management of differentiated thyroid carcinomas together. So I'm gonna move on to the follicular thyroid carcinomas. And these are less common, about 10% of all thyroid malignancies. As we said before, more common in um, iodine deficient areas. Um, they can present as a solitary thyroid nodule or it could be multiple, uh, multinodular uh, sort of disease and um, just one of them had the follicular carcinoma. Uh, it also can appear as an indolent, long-standing nodule that sort of rapidly enlarged. Um, this is one of the neoplasms that is very hard to identify on cytology, and that's why on the um, Bethesda system, the recommendation was to do a diagnostic hemithyroidectomy, which pretty much gives you the diagnosis because it really shows the vascular versus the capsular invasion, which is required to identify, um, to differentiate the follicular adenoma from the follicular carcinoma. Um, the follicular carcinomas, uh, they have more hematogenous uh, affinity and are more likely to have distant mets, although not very common. Um, and usually lymph nodes is not a major issue uh, at presentations with follicular thyroid carcinomas. 
very rarely a follicular carcinoma uh, could be hyperfunctioning. So in about 1% of the cases, follicular carcinomas could be hyperfunctioning and the, present, and the patient presents with signs and symptoms of thyrotoxicosis uh, from a toxic thyroid nodule. Um, and this is rare, but not completely um, absent. Now, Herther cell carcinoma, we've always considered it as part of the follicular carcinomas. Uh, in the recent guidelines in 2017, I believe, they uh, really decided to leave it as a distinct entity and have it as a differentiated thyroid carcinoma. And um, they have found that molecularly, it's more similar to papillary thyroid carcinoma. However, histologically, it uh, shares the feature of the need for capsular and vascular invasion on final pathology. Um, so usually they do say if it's a herthral cell lesion uh, and the nodule is larger than four centimeters, then the chance of malignancy is higher. Uh, but usually you can't make that diagnosis until uh, the final pathology is divided. It's, it could be more aggressive usually than uh, follicular neoplasms and papillary thyroid cancers. And the herthal cells itself, they do take up iodine, but they don't concentrate it um, as well as the papillary and the follicular uh, carcinomas. So when we talk about the management of, uh, of differentiated thyroid carcinomas, uh, really surgery is the mainstay of management. Other uh, management strategies are adjuncts to surgery, which is radioactive iodine, and then following that, the TSH suppression. And for the differentiated thyroid carcinoma, because of their good survival, for their good behavior, usually we want to think of surgery, but at the same time, consider the balance uh, between having an effective surgical treatment and the morbidity that can develop uh, from uh, the surgical resection. Um, so when we talk about surgery, we do want to remove all gross disease, but minimize morbidity. And if a patient does have clinically positive lymph nodes, these need to be removed. If it's a clinically uh, N0 neck, then there, there's a different um, approach to that that we'll talk about with the neck dissections. And the other option is if we will if we're thinking that this patient will receive radioactive iodine, we try to remove all normal thyroid tissue. Currently, um, the American Thyroid Association does not support uh, subtotal thyroidectomy. It doesn't support the wording of um, removing a nodule. So uh, nodular surgery is not supported either. Uh, you can either do a hemithyroidectomy or a lobectomy or do a near total thyroidectomy. And the reason uh, for calling a near total thyroidectomy is because there may be just microscopic tumor, but you do wanna remove all gross thyroid disease that you can see. So what to choose, a total or a hemithyroidectomy? And uh, in a case of suspicious or significant for uh, differentiated thyroid carcinoma. So we usually look at the poor prognostic features. And if they do have any features that are that indicate a poor prognosis, we sort of prefer or lean toward um, more complete surgery, uh, which is a total thyroidectomy. So here you can see all the features that are more aggressive in my mind. Uh, and according to both the American Thyroid Association and the NCCN, and it's an older age. So if you have age above 55, so um, if you guys have been following the AG, uh, the TNM classification, um, and they have 
sort of didn't have the age at all. And then they integrated the age uh, and it was in the 40s. And right now they changed the age to 55. So you, the cutoff for the age is 55. Above 55, it's a different uh, staging than below 55. Um, the reason is uh, the recent studies have found that um, patients above 60 years of age have had significant worse prognosis, disease control, and also uh, metastasis uh, presentation. The primary, so the second feature is the primary tumor more than four centimeters. The, um, if, if the tumor is from one to four centimeter, you sort of have uh, the leeway. If it's below one centimeter, a hemithyroidectomy is sufficient for that patient. Extra thyroid ex extension, you can see that on uh, your ultrasound. If there's any evidence of ultra, uh, extra thyroid extension, uh, preferably go for a total thyroidectomy. If there's evidence of multifocal disease, and this is something we see very commonly. So patients some of them do present with a solitary nodule, but more commonly we see the women that present with multiple thyroid nodules. And at that point, we really need to um, examine each suspicious nodule and do fine needle cyt uh, uh, aspiration cytology to see if we can get the diagnosis on uh, both of them. If there's evidence of cervical lymph node metastases, uh, clinically positive lymph nodes, then a total thyroidectomy is indicated. Um, if there's known distant metastases, then a total thyroidectomy is indicated. And in this situation, the, the reason is, is because the patient will need treatment of this metastasis using radioactive iodine treatment. And uh, with a few rare cases that we've had, we've had a patient diagnosed with pillary thyroid cancer from a uh, lung biopsy that came back as papillary thyroid cancer. And then when we examined the thyroid, it wasn't enlarged, there wasn't a huge nodule, but we had to remove the thyroid for the patient to receive the appropriate treatment for them. If there is any history of previous neck irradiation, uh, the recommendation is to go for a total thyroidectomy uh, to ensure proper treatment for these patients. If there's any evidence of a familial differentiated thyroid cancer uh, in the patient, family history of that, then a total thyroidectomy is more indicated. So, and really, the, the guidelines have been changing a lot uh, recently, and part of it and part of the drive for that are our Japanese colleagues, where the culture really doesn't allow to have a scar on the neck, and they have been pushing the limits with differentiated thyroid carcinoma and helping us understand the natural history of it and how much we can and we cannot do. Uh, I, I believe a lot more is going to come out uh, regarding differentiated thyroid carcinoma uh, and how much we can sort of do active surveillance for these patients. So with thyroid surgery, it's, there's the principle of uh, really removing all gross disease with minimizing morbidity with differentiated thyroid carcinoma. And the whole aim of this is to preserve function and to reduce the morbidity of the patient. Now, if the patient has large disease, bulky disease, aggressive disease, we need to remove the bulk of the tumor because most likely that patient will receive an adjunct to his treatment. Now, a lot of uh, trainees do ask, it, what do we do if the recurrent laryngeal nerve is involved? And usually it's you, the mainstay or the, the, the sort of the gold line, the guideline is to really preserve the nerve, okay? Unless there is a preoperative uh, vocal cord paralysis. If there is preoperative vocal cord paralysis on the same side, you may be able to sacrifice the nerve. And if you do sacrifice the nerve, it's important to uh, consider uh, re uh, procedures at the same time. Now, if there's involvement of the aerodigestive tract, 
there again you want to re resect gross disease and reduce the morbidity so if you're able to shave it off the trachea if it's not invading into the trachea then you can probably shave it off uh, you're not a you're not trying to get a negative margin like when we talk about squamous cell carcinomas or other uh, carcinomas this disease you're trying to remove the gross tumor so that when you give the patient adjunct to treatment namely the radioactive iodine it will be uptaken and it will take care of whatever microscopic disease you left sometimes uh, there is direct invasion with a fungating tumor within the trachea you try to remove the uh, gross tumor and reconstruct that part and then give the patient their adjunct. So let's talk about our central neck dissection. So when we say elective level six neck dissection, it's really you have planned it going in. So you know this patient has a papillary thyroid carcinoma and you know that either through a positive final aspiration cytology or you did a diagnostic hemithyroidectomy and you have your diagnosis and you're going back in for a completion thyroidectomy. Now in this sort of situation you need to consider elective level six neck dissection all right and the first step is examining the lymph nodes which you should have been do, had it done with the original ultrasound if there's no suspicious lymph nodes then you can let it be if there's suspicious no lymph nodes, then I do recommend that you have to do a fine needle aspiration cytology and uh, probably get more significant imaging like a CT scan uh, for uh, sort of characterizing the uh, lymphadenopathy um, anatomically. So if you have a N0 neck in level six, but the primary tumor is a T3 or a T4, you should consider doing an elective level six lymph node dissection. If the patient does have um, lymph nodes in the neck and it's a clinically N1B, then it's important uh, to uh, consider doing a neck dissection. Obviously these pa level six, I'm talking just level six or a central neck dissection. And it, the, some people, if you remember, I mentioned that for papillary thyroid cancer carcinoma, because of their affinity to the lymphatic structures, um, there is microscopic central lymph node involvement in up to 80% of the patients. And that's where the controversy came out uh, about whether to do or not to do a, uh, an elective neck dissection in the central compartment. And some advocates for not doing the central neck dissection really to reduce the morbidity, the less chance of um, hypoparathyroidism and recurrent laryngeal nerve injury. So they do say this patient is going to get radioactive iodine and this these lymph nodes will be treated and they do have a point uh, but again the guidelines from the american thyroid association really gives you the green light to make the decision it guides you a bit but it lets you uh make that call now central neck dissection is not necessary if you have a t1 t2 disease with a clinically N0 neck, or if you have a follicular carcinoma. So this is the guidance for the papillary thyroid carcinomas. Now, if, when we talk about lateral neck dissection, uh, which are levels two through five, these are done only in a clinically positive neck disease. So you've already got your ultrasound, you have suspicious lymph nodes, let's say in level three, you send them for an FNA that comes back positive, and then you proceed uh, with the neck dissection along with the total thyroidectomy. So you would do a level two through six. So risk stratification is a, a huge issue and it keeps changing um, 
and uh, each society has its own risk stratification, but the big picture items are the same. And the reasoning for the risk stratification is to decide on the adjuncts of treatment and to decide on the extent of surgery. And this is a big discussion that uh, sometimes happens at tumor boards uh, for people to sort of discuss where uh, we should go and what we should do. It gives an idea about how close uh, surveillance should be done and uh, how aggressive uh, the uh, oncologist should be with their surveillance and their management. I'm not gonna go into detail of that. Uh, I'm happy to ask, uh, to answer questions later if you have any. Um, in general, for follow-up of a differentiated thyroid carcinoma, um, you wanna, after you have the initial treatment, you wanna assess uh, the post-operative disease status. So, uh, and there's a really big push into using serum thy thyroglobulin and ultrasound over iodine scans. There, we're still using iodine scans a lot, but using the ultrasound as the primary uh, situation. And dependent on whether the patient received uh, ablation or not, uh, there are further uh, imaging studies to be done. And then the TSH uh, suppression goal, where we want the level, really goes back to the risk stratification that I just mentioned. So depending on the risk and depending on the treatment that the patient received, we decide on where we want their TSH level to be and also factored in the patient's health issues and how they interact with, um, with the levothyroxine. So I'm just gonna move over these. So again, favorite ultrasound and then look at serum thyroglobulin and um, assess the level of TSH based on risk stratification. For differentiated thyroid carcinomas, the goals of radioactive iodine treatments are to ablate any remnant tissues in the thyroid bed for higher risk patients. And here they do recommend you use the lowest dose possible, which is usually 30 millicuries. Um, it's used as an adjuvant treatment for patients who do have locally aggressive disease or uh, metastatic disease at presentation and then it can be used as therapy. So you can sort of have a cumulative dose of uh, radioactive iodine after discussing the risks with the patients. Um, any treatment we do carries its risks. With radioactive iodine, um, acutely the patient may have some change or loss of taste. They may have sialadenitis. One of the common ones is enlargement of the parotid gland and may develop neck pain depending on the amount of remnant thyroid tissue in the neck. Um, late complications is salivary gland damage where the duct becomes stenosed and they develop recurrent uh, sialadenitis. Um, they may develop dental caries depending on the level of xerostomia that they have, nasolacrimal duct obstruction, again, the same mechanism of the salivary gland ducts. Secondary malignancies can develop on the long run, and they could be bone or soft tissue malignancies, could be leukemias in the breast, in the kidney, and uh, salivary glands. Dysphagia is a rare, but... Um, uh, rare complication of uh, radioactive iodine. Sometimes it's simply just the xerostomia that they do have, but sometimes it's a true dysphagia from uh, fibrosis and stenosis. So the future for differentiated thyroid carcinomas is really molecular markers, and they're going to change uh, more with the prognosis. We know a little bit, but we'll know a lot more in the future. And with our Japanese colleagues, we'll be able to know more about active surveillance. So we know this patient has a differentiated thyroid carcinoma. Don't do anything and just watch them for a little bit. So just quickly on medullary thyroid carcinomas, they are they constitute one to two percent of uh, thyroid cancers. They're derived from the paraphernalia C cells and considered to be an, a neuroendocrine tumor. And um, they do secrete calcitonin, they secrete uh, carcinoembryonic 
uh, antigen. Um, they do have, these patients do have RET germline mutations, and the uh, RET oncogen is expressed in cells derived from the neural crest cells, the branchial arches and the urogenital system, so it's not surprising to see it here. We have two types, the, the sporadic and the hereditary. With the sporadic, it's usually diagnosed in the older patient population, and uh, it usually has a poor prognosis with patients presenting with um, cervical lymph node metastases in up to 70%, and 10% uh, of these patients do have distant metastases at presentation. Um, for um, the hereditary medullary thyroid carcinoma, it's an autosomal autodomin uh, dominant inheritance uh, with uh, almost 100% penetrance. It's usually associated with MEN2 syndromes. Uh, and it's, you, they usually have multifocal disease rather than a single uh, nodule. Um, the two commonly associated um, MEN2 syndromes that uh, are associated with medullary thyroid carcinomas are the 2A and the 2B. There are subtypes of the 2A, but we'll keep it simple. Um, 2A is found to be less aggressive, while 2B is a more aggressive disease. And usually if you identify a patient with medullary thyroid carcinoma, you men syndrome, you check their first degree relatives uh, for the uh, RET mutation. And if you identify anyone with that mutation, it's important to uh, have genetic counseling and discuss prophylactic thyroidectomy if they are young. So in men 2A be being less aggressive, we usually recommend prophylactic thyroidectomy pro before five years of age. But in 2B, being uh, very aggressive, the recommendation is um, in the first year of life, either, even in the first few months of life, if possible. And with these patients, just with the aggressive nature of the disease and um, the age being in the pediatric age group, it's always recommended to send them to a high volume center uh, to have it done. Again, with MEN2 syndromes, we really need to make sure that we do screen the patients for pheo chromocytoma to avoid any crisis, to also screen for hyperparathyroidism uh, in case the patient needs any treatment for that. It can be done at the same time. So for surgical management of medullary thyroid carcinoma, it's, uh, it's a clear cut, total thyroidectomy. Um, the central neck dissection is recommended in clinically N0 necks. Why? Because in, it was, they looked at different studies, obviously, and in a, in a study of a couple of thousand patients, they found that the T1 um, medullary thyroid carcinoma had up to 11% uh, risk of metastases uh, in the lymph nodes despite being clinically negative. So it's very, um, it's recommended to do a central neck dissection in a clinically N0 patient with medullary thyroid carcinoma. With the lateral neck dissection, the uh, guidelines are a bit wishy-washy. They say consider doing it in a clinically N0 neck. Obviously, if it's a clinically positive neck, you're going to proceed with doing that. So, with monitoring, the monitoring is mainly with calcitonin and CEA, with an ultrasound and with physical ex examination. There are multiple adjuncts that can be used with uh, uh, both uh, radiation as well as chemotherapeutic and targeted agents. Anaplastic carcinomas. Thankfully, it's very rare, about 1.7% of all thyroid malignancies. It's more common in endemic uh, iodine deficient areas. Um, the median survival for these patients is about five months, and they, it carries a one-year survival of 20%. So given that the thyroid has a very happy diagnosis generally, uh, the anaplastic carcinoma really takes the burden of all the poor prognosis. Uh, all patients at presentation are stage four disease. Anaplastic carcinoma is uh, sometimes a di dilemma for diagnosis. It's really important to diagnose it. Clinically, the patient may have a goiter that has been there for a long time and then developed rapid growth. 
Fine needle aspiration cytology is usually non-diagnostic, so it would be in a Bethesda one. And um, so the recommendation is either you do a core biopsy of the thyroid if you have um, experience in doing that, or um, you do an intraoperative frozen section. Let's say the patient had a thyroid, and the frozen section, the intraoperative thyroid section, uh, frozen section would be because you uh, were going in for a different reason. So for example, you were going in thinking you're dealing with a follicular adenoma that's causing some compression symptoms. But when you went in, you found a larger than expected tumor that's stuck to the surrounding tissues, that's very hard, then you can consider frozen section, although it may not give you the full diagnosis. Um, it's very important to establish the treatment goals with the patient in the treating team. And uh, these patients, despite their short survival, uh, do require a huge multidisciplinary team and a lot of social support because it, it's really a rapid sort of diagnosis and then death. Um, and if any of you have treated any of these patients, you understand what I'm saying. So the treatment is really palliative and surgery is really to um, palliate these patients, sort of give them a better quality of life, improve their uh, breathing if they have any compression uh, symptoms. Chemotherapy may be considered and radiation and all it's always the goal of treatment is palliation. We really don't have um, a, a good curative treatment for that. So the TNM classification, I will not dwell on that much. Uh, I just want to point out the T1As are those are the, the incendentilomas that we talked about. Um, and then the differentiation is the 55 year old is our cutoff for the staging. Excuse me. And the only one that's sort of sitting on its own is the anaplastic, which is always a stage four. So for principles of surgery, I'm just going to mention a few things. And then I do want to cover with you a few uh, cases. So these are the general features. So if you think they have a malignancy, you want to have surgery. Um, if there's a question of cosmesis, if the patient has obstructive symptoms, and the obstructive symptoms are either tracheal compression or dysphagia. And um, if it's a patient who is hyperthyroid and their endocrinologist has exhausted all their medical management and finally decided to send the patient to you. Or again, if you have documented metastasis from a thyroid carcinoma, uh, then you should uh, consider um, you should do a total thyroidectomy to be able to treat the metastases. Now with surgical approaches, um, we have the traditional central neck incision, and then there are beautiful other incisions and um, uh, that I do not have experience in, and then the robotic surgery. Uh, we're lucky here in Kuwait to have uh, Dr. Salman Safran, who does the transoral approach and um, really, for a patient who does not want the external uh, neck incision, that's a really excellent um, option for them. So the extent of surgery, depending on the patient, we need to think of the hemithyroidectomy versus the total thyroidectomy, whether we want to do a neck dissection, do we want to do a central neck or a lateral neck, and that really depends on the patient population. So going on to the procedure itself. Now, one of the things, I'm, I'm not going to go through the whole procedure. I'm just going to point out to a few things that I do want to mention. Um, the nerve monitor. We, do, we recommend using uh, the nerve monitor not to help you protect the nerve. It's really purely medical legal. So studies have been looked at that, and the surgeon experience has been the main factor that identifies um, the risk of injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, whether you have the monitor or not. Um, I usually do very small incisions and with minimal uh, subplatysmal flaps. Um, I prefer usually the um, lateral to medial approach. I rarely use the medial to lateral approach sometimes in difficult dissections. Um, 
we uh, we never divide the strap muscles and, and never say never, but um, haven't needed to, to divide the strap muscles so far, um, except for one of the huge goiters, like the picture that I showed you earlier. Um, the middle thyroid vein, as you know, it gives you the exposure. Usually after I um, sort of expose the lobe, I go into this beautiful cricothyroid tunnel, which is pretty much an avascular plane and a pretty safe plane for me to, able, to be able to identify uh, the superior pedicle and uh, divide it. Um, I'm, I'm very reliant on my amazing uh, retractors to be able to expose the superior pole for me. Um, and really, again, dividing the pedicle at the thyroid gland is the most important part to protect the nerves. One of the things I do not look for the nerves, uh, the recurrent laryngeal nerve, uh, it actually just comes to us, and I try if I'm have if I do want to make sure I want to dissect it. I don't dissect it in its full length. Uh, I usually tend to sort of dissect a short portion, expose, just make sure a it's there, move on, and never dissect it near one of the um, rigid points. So not at its entry into the cricothyroid joint, uh, because that's a very um, critical part where it may get injured. Um, so two things to make decisions about uh, the substernal goiter and most go substernal or retrosternal goiters are uh, the, their blood supply is really in the neck so you just have to flip them out. Very very um, rarely has it been reported in literature, the need for sternotomy. We always call our very friendly thoracic surgeons to be a standby and to be there uh, to support us and give us some mental support. Um, but it's usually uh, retracted and removed. Central and lateral neck dissections are a talk on their own. We kind of touched on them uh, and what we can do for them. Now, for complications, um, it's been well established that surgeon volume, uh, the higher the volume of thyroidectomies a surgeon does, the lower the complication uh, rates. And it's been reported in several centers by, diff by different people. Specific complications for uh, thyroidectomy. I always talk to my patients about the risk of a scar, of a wound infection, risk of a hematoma, and we'll talk about that. With the superior laryngeal nerve injury, I do talk about it with professional voice users, not with the general population. With the recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, injury, I talk with all of my patients about that. And it's, it's really important to um, keep it in mind. And bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve injury is a medical emergency, a surgical emergency, because they will end up with strider and will require tracheostomy for a certain period of time. Hypoparathyroidism, which could be transient or permanent, uh, and, uh, and then the thyroid storm. Now, thyroid storm, it's, uh, it's an emergency and uh, you can read all about it. It's uh, in all the books. So um, how about we go on to the cases, uh, Dr. Alulwa? Do you have any takers or? Um, yes, I will. Um, how, uh, can we do the MCQ so we can uh, okay. distinguish the post while we Perfect. look for um, residents and the participants? Okay, sounds good. So we'll put up the poll in a few seconds. All right. So again, the 40-year-old gentleman with a two centimeter solitary thyroid nodule identified on ultrasound. His fine needle aspiration cytology showed a flus. What's your next step? Repeat your ultrasound and FNA in three months. Reassure the patient to follow up in a year. Diagnostic hemithyroidectomy or a total thyroidectomy. So both are a right answer. So A and C is a right answer. Um, with thyroid, it's really hard to do MCQs because there's a lot of options, <laughs> but either one is a good answer. Um, as long as you know that you don't let the patient just go away, they're fine. You just, the patient does need follow-up and does need some sort of 
uh, intervention till we figure out what FLUS is a little bit more. Okay, next question. So this is the 30 year old gentleman with the 3.5 uh, centimeter thyroid nodule that was positive for papillary thyroid carcinoma. The ultrasound showed multiple thyroid nodules. The largest was 3.5 with small scattered uh, lymph nodes with preserved hyla. What's your next step? Fine needle aspiration cytology of the lymph node, hemithyroidectomy, total thyroidectomy, total thyroidectomy with a level six neck dissection and a total thyroidectomy with an ipsilateral uh, neck dissection levels two through, through six. So again, a total thyroidectomy with level six neck dissection. So the reason I put this question is because the lymph node has a preserved hyla. So it's not suspicious. I honestly wouldn't do a fine needle aspiration cytology of that kind of lymph node. If it did give me no hyla for the lymph node, I would not... I would do a fine needle aspiration cytology. Does that make sense? Um, with this patient, um, it's positive for papillary thyroid cancer. He has multifocal, uh, multiple thyroid nodules. The largest is 3.5, so it's really at the cutoff. Uh, I would be more toward doing a total thyroidectomy with or without a level six neck dissection. So it's either the C or D. You can fall into that, okay? So this is the 45-year-old gentleman presented with medullary thyroid carcinoma. During his investigations, he was found to have the Mentubi, and further investigations of his family identified the two-year-old child that has Mentubi, and the management of the child. Follow-up with an annual ultrasound from the age of five, serum thyroid globulin every six months, serum calcitonin every six months, consider total thyroidectomy at the age of five, and consider fine needle aspiration cytology uh, annually. I have a feeling I wrote this question wrong. How come? You tell me. All right, so a child with a MEN2 syndrome does need a thyroidectomy. Based on the aggressiveness of the disease, you decide the age of the patient at the time of the surgery. So, uh, so let me go back and show you guys. Uh, it's just here. Um, sorry, one second. So never follow up a child with um, with um, uh, men two. You always want to do the thyroid, the total thyroidectomy. And why I said I did it wrong is because MEN2B is more aggressive. So MEN2B, you do want to remove their thyroid in the first year of life. Given that the patient was diagnosed at two years of age, you want to start planning to do it as, or as soon as possible. So those who took, wrote total thyroidectomy at the age of five, you're sort of in the right direction. Uh, with MEN2A being the less aggressive, you want to remove their thyroids before the age of five. But with 2B, it's within the first year of life, you want to take out their thyroids. Does that make sense? So never follow up a patient who has uh, a child who you find the mutation for MEN2B. I hope that makes sense. So straightforward, which of the following thyroid cancers does not take up iodine? medullary, papillary, follicular, or herthal cell. Oh, I like this one better. So I didn't mention that in my slides, but I, I was hoping you would get it uh, as a common sense. So papillary and follicular definitely take up iodine. So we do have non-iodine avid differentiated thyroid carcinomas, and these are rare. They're not the usual. With herthal cell carcinoma, I don't know if you remember I told you, it doesn't take up iodine as much as, but it does take up iodine in comparison to medullary. Because medullary, what is medullary? It's, it's not part of the follicular cell that does take up the uh, iodine. It originates from the parafollicular C cells who do not touch the iodine at all. So medullary thyroid carcinoma is the one that doesn't take up the iodine. Herthal to a less degree, but it does take up some iodine and papillary and follicular are highly uh, iodine avid. 
All right, so in the post-operative room, after thyroid surgery, the patient developed sudden respiratory distress. The dressing was removed, it was slightly blood-stained, and the wound was bulging. What will be the first thing to be done? Tracheostomy, cricothyroidotomy, uh, laryngoscopy and intubation, or remove the stitch and take the patient to the OR. Awesome. So, um, tracheostomy, cricothyroidectomy, um, are not completely incorrect, but they are kind of incorrect because this is a patient who just left the operating room and he developed or she developed a hematoma. Um, and as soon as you remove the stitch, you're gonna relieve the hematoma and give yourself a break, okay? Give, you, give yourself some time to reach the OR and be able to intubate. They'll be breathing a bit better as soon as that pressure off the neck. Um, laryngoscopy intubation is correct, but the uh, anesthetist won't be very happy with you uh, because the anatomy will be distorted. If you remove the stitch and sort of release that kind of pressure, uh, it's probably going to be an easier intubation for them. So, yeah. So this is a hematoma, which is a complication that can happen post-thyroidectomy, right? Okay, so do you want to go on to the case scenarios? Sure. So. All right, so this is the first case. Okay, we chose a resident, uh, Dr. Fahad Saleh, for this Shana. case. Scenario. We're going to have to. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam, Shonak Dr. Alhamdulillah. First, thank you for the amazing lecture. My pleasure. I, I, I had more to say, but it's such a dense topic, so uh, I tried to rush over it. So let's get into this. So this is a 45-year-old gentleman who with multiple thyroid nodules presents to your clinic. He comes in uh, with his ultrasound. He ha you see that the largest on the left is 2.5 and the largest on the right is four centimeters. And the fine needle aspiration cytology was suggestive of follicular neoplasm. So um, what's your next step? So um, first, we'll begin with a full detailed history and examination, uh, looking for mm -hmm. risk factors. Uh, if there's any previous family history of any uh, thyroid-related uh, cancers or radiation exposure, we okay. will uh, define if the patient has any compressive symptoms or any evidence of distance uh, metastasis with him. Okay. And uh, we'll uh, make sure to um, review the images of the... Of the um, the ultrasound that there's no um, uh, pathological lymph nodes that were not mentioned in the report, and then we'll yeah. uh, proceed with a full uh, physical examination, uh, mm -hmm. looking at the neck and uh, examining the thyroid gland, looking for cervical lymph nodes, and uh, looking for you know signs and symptoms of hyper and hypothyroidism, to see if it's a functioning or not, and then okay. we'll proceed with. Um, uh, number okay, one. So, he, so the patient is euthyroid. He oh. doesn't have any uh, risk factors um, that would put him as a higher risk. Um, he, on ultrasound, they couldn't see any suspicious lymph nodes. So all his lymph nodes had preserved hyla. Um, how did you check for distant metastasis? You asked. You said you would check for distant so, metastasis. So like. What I mean is that if the patient has any symptoms uh, like um, respiratory symptoms or anything that might indicate okay. something distantly that we need to investigate. Okay. So just for a pointer for you, distant metastases is in thyroid cancer usually is asymptomatic unless it, it's a, it usually asymptomatic. Um, okay. So you have these pieces of information, you thyroid, no high risk uh, factors, and uh, no lymph nodes on ultrasound. Okay, and uh, we will um, uh, review the histopathology report with the, with, the, with the histopathology team, with the pathologist to confirm the, the diagnosis, and uh, oh. after which we would uh, do our routine lab investigations for the patient, looking for the TSH and the, the, the T3, T4. You said that you know, the patient is euthyroid. And uh, once the, the follicular neoplasm is 
confirmed uh, on the mm -hmm. histophage review, then we will uh, counsel the patient for the need for a surgical intervention. Mm -hmm. So what kind of surgical intervention do you want to do? Uh, I would uh, proceed with a, a total thyroidectomy in this situation, given okay. that there's bilateral node, uh, nodules, both on the left and the right, and yep. it's multiple nodular disease as well. Okay. All right. Um, so you proceeded with your total thyroidectomy. When you're planning your surgery, uh, which side do you want to start with? The right side and the, or the left and why? Um, I will uh, begin with um, the right side being the largest and the one with the FNAC that suggests the follicular neoplasm. Okay. And uh, being the more pathological, like the, the more higher risk site in case if there is okay. any, any complication that might lead us to abort the procedure or not. Okay. So uh, both FNA, so you have a really good cytologist. So they did FNA from both these big nodules and both were suggestive of follicular neoplasm. So I agree with you. I would start on the right side, but for a different reason. Okay. So my reasoning would be is protecting the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Yeah. So let's say um, you, as you're dissecting your right thyroid lobe, you are not comfortable with the situation of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. What would you do? Uh, would you I, proceed to the left side or would you hold off? I didn't understand the question. Can you repeat it? Please? Okay. So and you started in the right side, you started your right hemithyroidectomy, and during your dissection, the recurrent laryngeal nerve, you felt uncomfortable dissecting the tumor off the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So you have concerns that you may have created blunt trauma to the recurrent laryngeal nerve while you're dissecting the tumor, which happens. So what would you do at this point? You're still on the right side. Uh, I will, um, if I have a, a nerve monitor in this situation, I would uh, check to see if the, if the thyroid, uh, if the, the nerve is, um, is uh, giving me the feedback or not. And if uh, I will also call my senior in this uh, situation for a reassessment. But if there is a, uh, a concern that the nerve might be injured or that might have been a problem, then we would stop. We will abort the procedure of doing the right side only and uh, tackle the, the, the left side uh, on, a, on a later day. All right. Dr. Fahad, uh, I, I really like that you wanted to call your senior. Oh. <laughs> You're going to reach a point where you're the senior. So let's say your senior said proceed and you went on and did the left side. And okay. then uh, you, so you proceeded. The left side was uneventful. And then um, you are such a good surgeon. You were still in the room while they're extubating the patient. And when they extubated the patient, the patient was having strider immediately they took out the endotracheal tube and he was like, ah, what would you do? So, what so um, if uh, in this situation, um, we have either, uh, we need to secure the airway. If the mm -hmm. uh, anesthesia team are unable to secure an, uh, from an, uh, and uh, like uh, from an oral endotracheal intubation uh, situation, then uh, the, the, our next step will be a surgical airway in this situation. Yeah. And usually, so the suspicion is? Is a recurrent nerve, uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, most likely bilateral because the, yes. the strider. So bilateral, the strider does not happen in unilateral. It has to be bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve injury. Yep. Um, so yes, and this patient will need a tracheostomy for a while till you figure out if the nerves are going to work or not. So just keep that in mind. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fahad. Well done. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Do you have a second taker? Um, yes, we have uh, Dr. Nafarraj Rajri for the second case. Right. Salam alaikum, Dr. 
وعليكم السلام هلا دكتور مفرج يعطيك العافيه الله يعافيك so here's your patient a 52 year old diabetic lady presents with a midline neck mass that has been there for many years um, and the she presented to your colleague in clinic and uh, had an ultrasound that showed multiple thyroid nodules filling the thyroid lobe. They really didn't give you much characteristics or, um, or um, uh, features of it. Um, the fine needle aspiration cytology was done. It wasn't diagnostic. There was a lot of uh, hemosiderin and some blood. And immediately after she was admitted, admitted to the emergency department because she developed some strider and airway difficulties post FNAC. Um, so you go and meet them. She's stable and you're able to manage her medically with some steroids and sort of temporize things. And um, the family thinks that after the FNA, they developed a hematoma and that's probably the main reason of it. Um, so what are you thinking and what's your next step? Uh, in this situation, uh, I'm thinking uh, there is any vessel injury or a tracheal injury that's caused by the uh, FNAC. Mm -hmm. And I'll assess the patient situation, check her ABC, and I'll check her uh, airway and uh, how's the ventilation, the barometers. Okay. And uh, I'll check her chest. I'll see, check that uh, she has uh, uh, any pneumothorax or uh, that could be developed from the FNAC. And, that's uh, that's far-fetched. That usually with thyroid, uh, why it weird in they con pneumothorax? But yes, vascular injury. Rarely tracheal injury. The trachea is very resistant to getting injured, but um, it could be. It definitely could be. So while you were talking to your patient, the CT scan came back and you see these images. And I just picked two of the more prominent images uh, of the CT scan. Any thoughts? Uh, I'm seeing diffuse uh, thyroid uh, enlargement uh, with the uh... Uh, multiple uh, lymph nodes mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and uh, maybe some blood around it hematoma so and okay where do you see the hematoma here no, the periphery these are the peripheries okay the anterior side maybe okay not much, okay. What, what do you see something else that's very prominent? Uh, trachea is uh, like uh, constricted. Yeah, tracheal compression, decent tracheal yeah. compression. So what are you thinking at this point? What do you want to do for this patient? Uh, I'm just gonna remind you, see her FNA is non-diagnostic. She has a huge diffuse thyroid in her neck that um, she's been ignoring for many years. Yeah, I think uh, she got diffused enlargement and that she uh, that led to compression of the of the yeah. throat trachea. Yeah. So what do you want to do for her? What's your next step? In this case, uh, patient. Uh, will experience like difficulty extubation and uh, I think the anesthesia will not be able to extubate her. So mm -hmm. I think she needs surgery uh, to take off this uh, thyroid. Yeah. Okay. So in your surgical planning, what are things that you want to do? Yeah. I know this yeah. really sounds like, what am I thinking? But um, basically, <laughs> right. yeah. I, I know, I'm sorry, but I, I do want to get a point through, but I just, yeah. bear with me. <laughs> Yeah, it's okay. Uh, most important thing, uh, I'll see the thyroid extension to the chest. Uh, okay. That will determine and uh, prepare her for the surgery. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, no external extension, it's all in her neck. 
And uh, how far from the aortic arch? Um, there's a good distance. Uh, you, you, there's a nice clean plane that you, you can see on scan. Okay, perfect. And I'll uh, make sure uh, uh, the lymph nodes in the central and lateral neck mm -hmm. and supraclavicular uh, nodes. Awesome. Awesome. So, um, anything else? And, what do you uh, think of her sure. airway? What do you think of her airway? What do you want to do for her airway? Um, this patient, I'm afraid of the trichomalacia, especially post op. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I don't know if there is any special thing we, can, we have to do pre op for in these cases. Yeah. So, so, for this case, I would be prepared for maybe a longer intubation and ICU yeah. admission. And be prepared for a possible tracheostomy. We hate doing tracheostomy with a surgical bed, yeah. but um, have the patient prepared for it preoperatively, just given the significant um, narrowing. I, I do have other pictures where it's even more narrow. Now, I'm, I'm gonna tell you a few little things. When I examined this patient clinically, um, her neck was so stiff. It felt like the mass was moving with the whole neck like one piece. Um, and at that point, I was suspicious that this is something more sinister than a thyroid goiter. Um, so I was honestly worried it's an anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. And usually with anaplastic thyroid carcinomas, you want you do not want to go to the OR with these patients unless you really, really, really have to. So um, we tried to get another FNA. It was still non-diagnostic. And her airway was getting worse. So yeah. at that point, we actually took her for a... The, the possible tracheostomy, given the culture in our region, um, yeah. tracheostomy is not widely acceptable. So it was more like, let's see if we can excise it. If we can't, the main aim is to get her to breathe and put a tracheostomy. And um, intraoperatively, I did have my pathologist who I really trust and uh, uh, he, he's a very good histopathologist. Uh, be ready for frozen. Although in thyroid, we really don't like frozens. So he, um, we, when we went intraoperatively, it was like a rock. The thyroid was like cutting through bone. And uh, that kind of gave me the sense that this is not the regular goiter, not the parath not the papillary, but I, even though I wanted to give her a chance. So all I did is took a little block send it to pathology. And they called me saying, listen, I don't know if this is anaplastic, but this is definitely not papillary. Okay. So my differential was anaplastic versus lymphoma. And both of them carry different diagnosis. We put in a tracheostomy uh, to secure her airway because she wasn't able to secure it. And her thyroid, it was so enlarged to the extent that it was stuck to the tracheal wall. It was invading and stuck to the tracheal wall. It, I haven't seen anything like that. Um, it turned out eventually to be anaplastic thyroid carcinoma and the patient passed away in about two to three months. So the whole idea of this case, honestly, I brought it because um, I want to remind you that anaplastic, you want to avoid to go to the operating room. And this is what I tried to do with this case, but her airway was the reason we had to go to the operating room. So just a reminder, if you're suspicious of anaplastic, do as much as you can not to go to the operating room and get the diagnosis before that. Does it make sense? Yeah. All right. Any other questions or, um, these are the two cases that I had. Um, we have a few questions in the Q&A, um, but we, we're a little bit over time, so okay. we're going to take a few questions, if that's okay. Okay. And thank um, you, Dr. Farad, for answering these questions, and Dr. Fahad. All right. Um, 
So complications related to thyroid, so I'm, I'm going to go through them very quickly and then just mention some stuff. So complications related to thyroid carcinoma. There are so many, and it depends on whether you're talking about surgical complications or complications of disease, and you'll find this in all the textbooks, so inshallah, you'll be able to do that. Patient who underwent thyroidectomy. So advice to give to a patient who underwent thyroidectomy. It really differs if the patient did have... Um, um, if, if the patient had the diagnosis of carcinoma versus a diagnosis that is benign. So it, the advice is different. And depending on the diagnosis, you can give the advice. But like a blanket statement uh, for thyroidectomy, it's very hard to answer that question. I'm sorry. If a patient has thyroiditis and a thyroid lump, should we do fine needle aspiration cytology or treat thyroiditis first. I would do both at the same time, depending on the size of the thyroid nodule. So if it's a more than one centimeter in size with uh, worrisome features, then we should do that. Um, so for the last scenario, would you do tracheostomy in the OT or, take the or you take the patient for uh, close monitoring? Both. So I wouldn't do a tracheostomy for this patient um, in the ICU because uh, it's a clear contraindication to um, to um, uh, a perk trach because you have a bunch of thyroid in front of you and it felt very hard on palpation. So I didn't want to take that risk. So it's a contraindication to start with. And then we took her to the ICU for close monitoring after having the tracheostomy. And uh, prior to that, she was in the ICU for monitoring because of the airway. Differential diagnosis of a cystic thyroid nodule. If it's a, bin, if it's a, a pure cystic thyroid nodule, most of the time, it's just a colloid nodule. Uh, if it, it's a combined uh, solid and cystic structures, it can have multiple uh, diagnoses, which are benign or malignant.